it's really nice of you to make time to, to squeeze us into your, your schedule today. Well, thanks. I'm happy to be here. Now, given the fact that all your books are so different, one from another, can, I, would I assume that that's a response to the topic rather than an evasive action to keep from being genre hold? You know, I, I've never been one to sort of plan out my career. You yeah. know, when I was 20, I'd say, well, I'll do these these books and then this book and this book, I pretty much go with my interests and I have a lot of different interests and um, you know I, I started out really as a poet and I'm coming back to poetry too and now publishing poetry again as well. Um, I just think that as a writer why um, declare sort of genre loyalty to right. one, I mean I, I come from a family of writers. My father was a poet and translator and novelist uh, and editor and my mother was a short story writer and a novelist and so with that as my uh, sort of rubric if you will uh, I thought well I can do any of these things. Why not? The topic is there and I'll write it as I want to. Yeah and a lot of these things sort of fell into place naturally. I didn't say well now I'm going to become an investigative journalist and now I'm yeah. going to become a memoirist. Um, they just happen naturally. In fact, I sometimes marvel at the way my career has gone, how I morphed in some ways from a fiction writer. I mean, I love writing fiction. I still love writing fiction. Um, uh, but I just started writing nonfiction and haven't looked back. I heard you say, I think on Vermont Public Radio, that that idea surfaced during a session with your students in a bar. Well, I was here, it was at the sanctuary in uh -huh. town, um, and it was, uh, we had a monthly uh, pitch session with some of my students who were interested in literary journalism, and we just decided to get together once a month and pitch stories to one another. And, um, and so we did that, and uh, one day I just had this idea, and I just mentioned it to my students. I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if I could go back to summer camp and do it again, and uh, you know, be now that I'm I'm older and wiser and stronger, and uh, you know, I could beat these kids at basketball and kickball right. and things like that. And they thought that was a great idea. So I wrote up a pitch and pitched it to the first magazine. They said sounds good but no thanks and then I pitched it to the second magazine New York magazine and they really liked it and we went from there and then once I finished that piece uh, which was called Big Man on Camp uh, I just thought you know this is fun I could do a book of these I, I, I know I could so, and you did and I did yeah it wasn't quite that simple but <laughs> no but it happened <laughs> yeah <laughs> I must say when I, when I first heard the premise mm. for Do Over I thought well, that's a stunt. Mm. Um, and then I read it, and it's it's quite a bit more substantial. I hope so. Than, yeah. than that, um, it it seems to have the kind of structure of a what I th I think of as a, as a double decker memoir. It gives you the scaffold to to hang on to the the stories you're remembering, and then to to weave in on top of that your own almost current thoughts about your life now and, and looking back. So it's got those, again, multiple pers perspectives. And yeah, I, I actually call it uh, immersion, <coughs> immersion memoir. You know, you've heard of immersion journalism. And my idea of immersion memoir is the idea that of instead of just sitting and reflecting, you're actually participating in uh, like participatory journalism, going out and doing something yeah. that becomes a trigger for um, these other memories. So you're both uh, reflecting, but also there's a story, a forward story in the, in, in the book as well. And uh, that sort of gives a kind of double, as you say, a double-decker quality to it. Yeah, it's, I, I really like the, the weaving back and forth between you know, your current circumstance and the, and the circumstances you were, you were recalling. Yeah, well, I didn't want it to be just a book of um, separate magazine articles stitched, stitched yes. together where I you know, went back to kindergarten, then I went back to summer camp, went back to the prom, school play, all of that. But I, I knew I needed something that would be a kind of narrative glue. 
And it just kind of presented itself to me. I'm a divorced dad. I have uh, uh, four children, four daughters from two marriages. And, um, and uh, I knew that my daughters, my older daughters, would be a, a central part of the book. Uh, and that my, uh, my, my younger daughters would as well. Although I only had one younger daughter at the time. And, Just Soshi. Uh, Shoshi, yeah. And um, uh, the other one became <laughs> uh, an unexpected plot point. <laughs> yes, I mean, and, and it Unintended. seemed to me, it, though you, you don't hit it very hard, it, it, when it chimes in someplace about a third of the way through, mm -hmm. that you, you, you learn your wife is pregnant. And then that just seems to bring forward uh, throughout the rest of the book as, as an inevitable new kind of do-over. Right, right. I mean, it just happened that way. It was certainly wasn't something I intended. You know, I had no idea this was going to happen when I started the book, of course. Um, and but it it kind of happened at the right moment in the in narrative. The plot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, it's, it's, it's very strange, but yeah. that's how it happened. Talk a little bit about the. I'd like the section in which you go back to kindergarten. Yeah, that's one of my favorites too. Uh, it was probably the second do-over I did. I, I did it here at uh, Horace Mann Elementary School. Um, I, um, I contacted the teacher and the principal, and through a, a friend of mine, uh, I, mean, I had to sort of go in through different channels. Because you know, obviously, a 48-year-old man can't just say, "I want to go back to kindergarten," and people say, creepy. "Oh yeah, <laughs> of course, come on back," you know. So you have to have background checks and people yeah, vouch for you, and of course, yeah. So I, I went through all the proper channels and, and you know, had, had everything, you know, tested and I was certified as fine. So I... Uh, uh, you had the no creep stamp of approval. No right? creep stamp of approval. And I, you know, I, I, I went into the um, kindergarten for a week. I thought that would be enough. and. Uh, and it, it was, and it was really exhausting, you know, going back to kindergarten. You see, by 10 a.m., you've already done about 10 activities, you know, yeah. and there's a lot of spontaneous dancing and singing and <laughs> things like that. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, and, and I found it to be what was really remarkable about the experience was that the, we thought the, prin the principal and the teacher and I met with some of the parents beforehand, and we thought that w most likely the kids would view me the way they view any adult observer from, say, the education department, because they get a lot sure, here in a university Sure, that's part yeah. of their job description. Right. So, um, but, it, but something very strange happened. They were told, these kindergartners were told that I was going to go back to kindergarten because I'd had a bad kindergarten experience. I really did. I had a, uh, a kindergarten teacher who was committed to uh, a mental institution the year after I, had, I was in her class. And, and so I... Uh, just sitting at yeah, she was just really <laughs> crazy, um, and so uh, uh, they were told this that I was going to be a big kindergartner, and they accepted that. They knew I was old and big and everything like that, but they just accepted it. So right away, um, they start showing me the ropes, and uh, were I was very popular at recess. I was I was always it and tag, and uh, and we were all surprised how well they adjusted to me. I knew they ad adjusted to me pretty well when on the first day. Um, after school, um, one of, we were sitting in a circle and one of them said to me, um, so who's picking you up after school? And uh, I said, my wife. And they all looked at me like, like that was the strangest thing a yeah. kindergartner could ever say. And, and, they, and one of them said, well, I thought you were going to say your dad. You know? right. so, so I knew that I was, was home free. Well, you were a real kindergartner. I was a real kindergartner at that point. That's nice. And in, in the, in that section, like all the others, does have, um, all, I don't know, almost equal weight on your reminiscence about being a <laughs> kindergartner. The original? The, yeah, the original, the original experience. I always tried to do that. I always tried to balance, you know, tell the sort of original story and why, why I need it to or want it to have a do-over of sorts. Um, and, um, and in this case, it was this, you know, teacher I had who would, yeah, uh, Mrs. Collins, who just had this vendetta against me. and It was kind of you to forgive her. <laughs> well, I mean, a lot of these things 
I, well, I mean, she gave me a lot in that she gave me a great story. Yes. You know, um, I was, I wouldn't if say... If only you had known that when you were five. Right? But even then, she, I don't really felt, feel as though she really traumatized me. I mean, uh, she was abusive, but not, you know, abusive in a way that you couldn't get over, you know. Um, and I mean, people have had far worse than that. Uh, so it wasn't as though I really had some psychic wound that needed yeah. to be uh, healed. It was more that um, I saw it as a way to reflect back and to also to think about childhood as my daughters were living it, the hoops yes, that yes, they yes. were going through. So it was a way um, not only to think about my life but to think about theirs too. Yeah, I think that they get to be part of the do-over as well. Yeah, yeah. I think us kids do that for you. Yeah. And you know what was interesting is uh, I was asked recently if anyone, they, uh, someone in a class had asked me said well said. It seems that remarkable that so many people were on board with your project. You know, did you leave out any people who uh, uh, objected to it or didn't didn't want to go right. along with it? And there were were remarkably few people. I mean, even the the kids seemed to understand the idea of regret and wanting a second chance. Um, and that seemed to me one of the most remarkable things I learned from that was that that the idea of regret is something that that comes on early in our lives, and that the the idea of wanting to make amends or or have another chance is something that uh, that we want from a very early age too. Thanks for spending some time with oh, us. It's, my it's pleasure. been uh, it's been great to chat with you. Great chatting with you too. We'll do it again sometime. I hope. I, I hope so. Thanks a lot, Bruce. Thanks, Robert.